Thank you, Jeff. Okay, let's start. So first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about our recent work on ultra-fast quantum repeaters for long-distance communication. And this work is done in collaboration with many people, including people from Yale, Waterloo, Duke, and Harvard. And uh, so as we're all familiar with that uh, quantum mechanics enables secure communication. And one of the major challenges right now is actually when in the presence of fiber attenuation, the communication rate decreases exponentially with distance. And when the distance goes to more than 1,000 kilometers, the communication rate actually becomes so low that it's practically useless. And actually, this limitation is independent of how you encode the information. You can use single photons, or you can use co co coherent states. In the presence of this significant loss, the communication rate has been shown to be upper bounded by this exponential decay. So therefore, we need to think about active quantum repeater protocols or other quantum schemes to overcome such loss error. And one way to do it is to use satellite-based quantum key distribution. But this scheme might, and even though there are a lot of activities on it, it potentially has some limitations, including it has limited bandwidth, it depends on weather, and it's very expensive to launch and very difficult to fix. On the other hand, it's also interesting to consider the other option, which is to use quantum repeaters based on current fiber technology. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus most on quantum repeaters. But before I talk about quantum repeaters, maybe let's briefly look what we've been using all the way for classical repeaters, including way earlier in China, people use smoke signals to relay the information. And in Africa, people use sound signals to relay the information. And nowadays, actually, we use optical signals with undersea cables to achieve the current internet technology. But different from the classical world, in the quantum world, there is a key limitation, which is a major challenge from the quantum known cloning theorem, which says that unknown quantum states cannot be perfectly cloned. But at the same time, there's also an opportunity, which is the quantum entanglement. And quantum entanglement is a resource that does not exist in classical world, but it enables us to achieve quantum state teleportation, entanglement swapping, or even non-local coupling gates. So we'd like to see if with this quantum entanglement, can you do something better than just single exponential decay of the communication rates. And in order to build, consider a realistic quantum repeater, we should take into account two major imperfections. The first imperfection is the loss error, which comes from both the fiber attenuation and also the coupling and detection inefficiency. On the other hand, there's another type of error called operation error, which which I mean by operation error is that the error still occurred within your logical space, such as channel decoherence, memory error, logical gates error, or me measurement errors. So a working quantum repeater protocol should be able to overcome both of these type of errors. So before we move on, actually let's take a quick look about the key ideas of quantum repeaters, which actually already been captured in the previous tutorial. So the key idea of quantum repeater Actually, the main challenge is to overcome the loss error. So in order to achieve a challenging task of generating a long distance bell pair, we actually decompose it into smaller, more feasible tasks. For example, we can generate shorter distance bell pairs based on heralded entanglement generation. And we can generate many of these short distance bell pairs and store them in the quantum memory. And because we have the quantum memory, we do not need to simultaneously generate these bell pairs. So therefore, there is no exponential overhead to generate these bell pairs that's stored in the quantum memory. And once we have these bell pairs, one can perform entanglement swapping operation to generate longer distance bell pairs. And then in the end, we generate the long distance bell pair that we want. And actually, in the presence of operation errors, this scheme is not too bad. Basically, the errors accumulate linearly with the number of repeater stations you have. But still, it poses a limitation about the total distance that you can achieve before, uh, while you still want to maintain 
a non-trivial quantum entanglement over long distances. Okay, but actually we'd like to do better to overcome further this limitation. All right, so now let's actually take a more systematic look about how to overcome loss errors and operation errors. And that actually leads us to a discussion about three possible generations of quantum repeaters. So let's first look how to correct or suppress loss errors. So basically there are two ways to do that. The first way is to do it with a heralded entanglement generation. And this is a probabilistic but heralded scheme which requires two-way classical signaling between the repeater stations. On the other hand, we can also use quantum error correction to correct the loss errors, and the, that only requires one-way classical communication. So in that sense, that this could be faster because it does not require the confirmation from the other repeater station. And similarly, for operation errors, there are also two ways to do it. One way is called, one approach is the heralded purification, which basically using more than one bell pairs and do local operation and classical communication to obtain a high fidelity bell pair. But this requires, again, two-way classical signaling. On the other hand, we can also do quantum error correction that only requires one-way classical signaling, which potentially can be faster. So now with these two approaches for each of these uh, errors to suppress each of these errors, we can actually come up with three generations of quantum repeaters. So the first generation of repeater basically use heralded entanglement generation and purification, which requires two-way communication or two-way classical signaling for both um, errors. And the second approach actually replace the purification with quantum error correction that only requires one-way classical signaling over longer distances. And the third approach use quantum error correction for both last and operation errors. And you may say that potentially can be a fourth approach, which turns out to be not so efficient. So that's why I only list three generations of quantum repeaters. So now let's first take a look at the first generation of quantum repeater. And the procedure, and, or the key idea of a first generation quantum repeater is essentially it tried to establish a self-similar architecture of heralded entanglement generation and purification. And this can be understood as the following. You first generate shorter distance bell pairs and do entanglement connection, generate a longer distance bell pair. Then use purification to purify this bell pair. Similarly, you generate another longer distance bell pair and do the entanglement connection, get longer, even longer distance bell pair and do the purification. And you can repeat this procedure on and on, so that leaves you to the nested self-similar architecture. And uh, as you can see, it requires a two-way communication between a remote repeater stations to complete the heralded entanglement purification. So this repeater schemes, the key generation rate de decreases when you go to longer distances. And turns out the time scaling of the key generation rate decreases polynomially with the distance, which is already a non-trivial achievement because if you do brute force, you will suffer from exponential decreasing of the key generation rate. However, this polynomial scaling is still a quite significant loss of key generation rates when you go to long distances. So overall, it's still relatively slow, and it also requires very good quantum memory, as mentioned in the tutorial. However, there are ideas, as mentioned, that one could potentially consider doing multiplexing for all these intermediate repeater stations using spatial, temporal, and frequency multiplexing, and potentially can, significant, can further boost the performance of first generation repeater. But one thing to remember is that there is a key limitation that it requires two-way communication over longer distances. So the longer you go, the slower repeater becomes. And therefore, when you go to longer than 1,000 kilometers, usually the first generation repeater is relatively slow. So that motivates us to consider the second generation of quantum repeater, which is to replace the slow heralded entanglement purification by quantum error correction. So we, instead of doing this, we do this one. So for the second generation of quantum repeater, you can think of it as the following. So the key idea is try to create almost perfect bell pairs at the encoded level, then do entanglement swapping. So let's first look at the simplest case without encoding. Suppose we just have bell pairs created between neighboring repeater stations, and one can perform entanglement swapping or connection to and actually, you can do these entanglement connections simultaneously 
and each repeater station just report two classical bits of information and send it to the end repeater stations. And based on this information, one can generate entanglement over long distances. And as I already showed earlier, the infidelity scales linearly with the number of repeater stations, which limits the total distance. However, if we do quantum error correction, we can actually suppress this operation error from epsilon to the epsilon to the t plus one. For example, we use an error correcting code using n physical qubits to encode one logical qubit that can correct two t, uh, that can uh, correct up to t errors. Therefore, you can suppress the error from epsilon to epsilon to the t plus one. And with this suppression of error, you can actually achieve a much better performance of your quantum repeater. So the idea is the following. First, you generate entangled uh, bail pairs at uh, the encoded level between neighboring repeater stations. Then you try to find a procedure to perform the entanglement connection operation so that you can generate longer distance entangled pairs. And this is all detailed in the following reference, but the key is the final infidelity scales now still linearly with the repeater station, but the, the coefficient becomes epsilon to the t plus one, which is a number can be very small. So therefore you can generate, you can have many repeater stations while still maintain high fidelity at the encoded level. And therefore you can get to very long distances with the help of this error correction so that epsilon raised to the power t plus one. And so um, actually we can look at the performance of second generation quantum repeater and here is a plot of the number of repeater stations the repeater can, uh, the entire structure can support versus the effective error. And this is a log log plot. And you will find that actually when the error gets very small, even though you do not do encoding, you can actually still support a finite number of repeater stations, which is not surprising. But what's nice is that when you go to larger and larger code, you will find actually for finance, financially small error, you can actually support a large number of repeater stations. That tells us that actually we can use error correction to help the performance of a quantum repeater. Okay, so just one remark about the related to experimental implementation. Actually, the second generation of quantum repeater, these protocols can be compatible with various uh, platforms, including nitrogen vacancy center, trapped ions, or trapped neutral atoms. So therefore, just as a summary, for a second generation of quantum repeater, the key idea is actually to create almost perfect bell pairs at the encoded level and uh, the time scaling of the key generation rate actually scales as one over tau further divided by polylog of L total. And this comes from, the polylog of L total comes from the overhead of the encoding that you need. And, uh, but the key uh, scaling comes from the tau zero, which is actually time required to generate entanglement between neighboring repeater stations. And this number can be much uh, shorter in time compared to the communication over longer distances. So that's why actually second generation quantum repeater can be faster compared to the first generation. Typical time scale, which can be about uh, kilobits per second for typical separation about like tens of kilometers. And as discussed in Bill Murray's paper, that you can suppress the memory errors efficiently using second generation of quantum repeater. And still there is a limitation of second generation quantum repeater which is actually, it still requires two-way communication between neighboring repeater stations. Of course, you can say, I put the repeater stations closer, closer to each other. I can make faster second generation repeater, but that will cost a lot of resources. And that actually motivates us, can we do something better to even remove the two-way communication between neighboring repeater stations? And that motivates us to think about the third generation quantum repeater, which is, to use actually error correction to correct both loss and operation errors. And so here is a simple diamet uh, schematic diagram of third generation quantum repeater. Basically, you prepare encoded quantum states at the first repeater station. Then you send these encoded quantum states using photons through the optical fiber. Of course, there will be photon loss or decoherence errors when photons going through the fiber. But as long as the loss of decoherence is not too significant, you can still correct these errors at the next repeater station before sending the encoded information further to the next repeater station. And they repeat this procedure until the encoded state is sent to the last repeater station. And this is actually a scheme which first outlined by Bill Murrow's paper in Nature Photonics. And actually we further 
detail about how one corrects errors at the repeater station. And the key idea is actually to do teleportation-based quantum error correction. So it's actually, even though it looks complicated, this is actually the conventional teleportation circuit. Basically, you start from a bell pair, shared between local resources, and with the incoming unknown quantum state, you can perform a bell measurement over the unknown state on half of the bell pair. And the condition now on the bell measurement, you can feed forward, do additional unit rotation on half of the bell pair, then you can recover the original incoming state. And you may notice that you can do this at all at the encoded level, if the encoded state is a special type of, uh, f uh, is encoded with a special type of error correcting code called the CSS type of code. And we actually look into a particular code, which is called the quantum parity code, which you can think of it as a GHD of a GHD state. Okay, so basically you have a repetition code, and then at the next level you do another repetition code, so that you can correct both defacing and the fit flip errors. And the key in this diagram, you may notice that the, all you need is basically to have a measurement of, to do a bell measurement, which requires a measurement of a logical X and a logical Z. And this actually can be completed quite efficiently for the quantum parity code. And here I just add one little, little more technical detail, is that it turns out, usually we would say when we measure a logical qubit, it will either be plus one or minus one. But it turns out it's convenient or advantage to have a third possibility, which is say a failure. Because at the encoded level, if we find the error syndrome is so dramatic, it's probably better to say we don't know what's going on instead of say randomly guessing a number. And it turns out that uh, in our scheme, we find it's actually an advantage to consider third possibility to say a failure of these measurements. Even though we suffer a little bit about the success probability, but the quantum bit error rate gets significantly improved. Because in the end, what we care is a combination of quantum bit error rate and success probability. And it turns out that it's an advantage to include such a failure, but we can still maintain a very high secure key generation rate. And this is actually also detailed in our paper, and this formula is actually based on some earlier work. And so now, just as a summary for the third generation of quantum repeater, it basically, it just uses error correction to correct both loss and operation errors. And the time scaling, which is the typical time scale is limited by local operation time. So basically, if you can do local operation really fast, you can actually do, achieve a very high key generation rate using third generation of quantum repeaters. And this similarly poly log L distance scaling also come from the overhead of the encoding that's needed. And the key advantage of third generation quantum repeater is it can be very, very fast. If you have a, like a megahertz or like a gigahertz rate, then you can actually generate these key generation rates to be very fast because it essentially behaves like the same way we do classical communication, which can be very fast. And of course, it can naturally suppress memory errors and there are also discussions about using all optical quantum repeaters which is, I think it's a natural extension of the third generation of quantum repeater. And of course, with all these good things, there's also something we need to achieve technologically in order to perform third generation quantum repeater, which first is that uh, the, key, the key challenge is, okay, we need a reasonably large encoding blocks, like tens or hundreds of qubits, for each repeater stations to perform the local error correction. And also, we need to have a more than 50% coupling efficiency, which means a photon from one repeater to the next repeater, the success probability to send such a photon need to be higher than 50%. The reason is that if there are more than 50% photon being lost, then we will not be able to correct such errors because of no cloning theory. So we summarize all these properties of the repeaters. We can actually show that the, the typical scalings of the key generation rates, and we can actually make a plot of the key generation rates. So here the dashed line is the brute force quantum key distribution. And first generation scales polynomially with the distance. So here vertical axis is a key rate. But second and third generations decay uh, relatively slowly, essentially poly log with distance. But uh, what I want to say is that this figure is not the whole story because it only tells you about the key rates, which is essentially the temporal resources. On the other hand, there is also physical resources which you take into account when you compare different quantum repeater protocols. So here, for example, I focus on the physical resources including the, number, uh, the num total number of qubits you needed throughout the entire repeater architecture. So, so in the end, we can actually introduce a cost function, which is a product of temporal and the physical resources. 
you can think it as the number of qubits and the time needed to generate a secure bit. And, it's, and actually for all cases, this cost function will scale at least linearly with the total distance. So therefore we divide, we introduce the cost coefficient, which is divide this cost function by the total distance, which you can think physically as the number of qubits and time we needed to extend the secure bits by further one kilometer. So this is the cost coefficient which we're going to use to compare different quantum repeater protocols. So in the following, I'm going to compare all three generations of quantum repeaters that I mentioned earlier. And uh, be, to be more specific, the first generation I'm going to consider the Brigo dual sirac zola scheme, which was pre presented essentially the first typical quantum repeater scheme. And the second generation of quantum repeater, I'm going to discuss this coding, but I ma mentioned there will be actually a separate, there are two different kinds. The first kind is actually using the code, CSS code. And if the error is really small, you can actually use the second generation without even encoding. So that's why I separate this as an NC, which says there's no coding for second generation. And the third generation scheme, which I also use the scheme that we outlined using teleportation-based error correction. And uh, the control parameters, basically there are four control parameters. One is the total distance we want to achieve. And the other three are the probability of gate error, the coupling efficiency between qubit and the fiber, and the time of local operation. And the, the criterion is the cost coefficient that I mentioned. So because we have four parameters, it's difficult to plot. So what I'm going to do is fix the total distance to be, say, 1,000 kilometers. We're going to plot, make a three-dimensional plot based on gate error, coupling efficiency, and time of local operation. So these are the three axes of time, coupling efficiency, and gate error. And I'm going to plot these different generations of quantum repeaters using different color. And I'm going to show a bubble plot where for each parameter point, I'm going to find the corresponding optimum. One of these schemes will be optimum. And I'll show that color. And the radius of those blobs will tell us about the cost function. So here is what we find numerically. Basically, you'll find that uh, some of these uh, second generation schemes show up in the, uh, in, the er in the region with a smaller gate error. And when gate error gets large, you get the first generation scheme. Okay. And it's a little bit difficult to, to look at this one, so I convert it. And I can actually make a denser plot. And uh, what you'll get is something look like this. Okay. So what you'll find is that when the gate error is high, you'll find the first generation quantum repeater becomes the most efficient one which is naturally true because it does not require, because error correction is very expensive and requires low gate errors. And actually when the error gate operation error is low, coupling efficiency is high and the gate speed is fast, then the third generation becomes the most dominant scheme. And uh, when the gate error is very, very low, you will find that actually you do not need to do any encoding. And the second generation without encoding is the most efficient scheme. And somewhere in between, you actually find there is a second generation with encoding that's needed between the first and second generation without encoding scheme. Okay, so this is kind of the parameter diagram we find for this particular distance. And if we further extend the distance, what we find is that these parameter regions just modified locally, but the general, general territories is still maintained. Here, the major change is that uh, the second generation without encoding gets replaced by the second generation with encoding. Because when you go to longer distances, it, you actually need to have a better way to suppress operation errors. So here is a summary of the properties of different regions. And uh, actually, if we look at the experimental parameters, actually you'll find that uh, all these parameters, they're actually quite within experimental reach for different physical systems. For example, you can achieve a very high gate error, a very small gate errors using trapped ions or superconducting circuits. And you can also do like a single atom switch using nanophotonics or cavities. And also you can do high efficient for single photon detections with integrated photonics. And also you can very, achieve very high efficient fiber wave guide coupling with efficiency higher than 97%. So in principle, if all these technology can come into one system, you should be able to do all the repeater schemes that we want. But of course the challenge is, experimental challenge is to have one physical system which can do all these things. Or maybe consider some hybrid systems that can do these things in a consistent way. 
So probably in the last four or five minutes, I'm going to actually switch gears, talk about something different. So, which is, so far we talk about uh, the three generations of quantum repeaters, and it seems the third generation of a repeater gives you the ultimate rate, like what we do with classical communication. And then one of the key challenges is to find efficient coding schemes for third generation of quantum repeater, which can efficiently correct loss errors. And uh, just recall here the diagram that would correct loss errors using teleportation-based error correction circuits. And uh, so far we've only looked at a particular code called quantum parity code, which can correct up to 30% errors. And actually there are better qubit-based code, like a surface code or a tree graph code, which can correct up to 50% errors, which is the upper bound that one can do. And there are also schemes using D-level systems called the quantum polynomial code, which can correct also up to 50% errors. And moreover, there are also possible schemes using continuous variables called cat code, which may not achieve 50% errors as high as the other guys, but it just uses one single optical mode to encode so that you can correct photon loss errors, which potentially can boost the channel capacity if you're just using one optical mode that intrinsically correct the errors. So that's why we actually look into both of these coding schemes. And uh, so here's just a, a quick summary of the quantum polynomial code, which uses a D-level system, a 2K plus one D-level system, to encode one qubit, which can correct up to K loss errors. And this is actually quite amazing, that the code can correct almost up to half of the loss. And it was nicely pointed out in this, in this paper in the context of uh, uh, quantum secret sharing. But here, for our purposes of correcting loss errors, we can actually use it, just one simple example, you can just use three qubit to correct one Eurasia error, which actually, for qubit case, you need at, mo at, at, least, uh, at, uh, at least four qubits to do that. But using three level systems, just the three qubit is enough. So this kind of shows the example that uh, a non-trivial capability of this quantum polynomial code. And, uh, when you take the k go to inf infinity, you can actually correct 50% loss errors. And the nice thing is that this is a CSS code, which is compatible with our teleportation-based error correction, so that we can actually, the scheme we had also works. And we actually did some estimation for the quantum polynomial code with one kilometer spacing between repeater stations. You can actually, with the 714 QDIT code, you can actually have a very um, high key generation rate all the way up to uh, up to like uh, 20,000 kilometers, uh, 2,000 kilometers. And also in terms of the cost coefficient, it is boosted by a factor of uh, three or four. Yeah. So that's one coding, which is very promising. And there's another coding, which is related to the continuous variable code. And as we all know, that actually with the, the Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth, actually what we're nowadays using is called the phase shift key. Basically to use the phase of a coherent state to encode the information. And can we do something similar in quantum case? And the answer is yes, but there is a trick you need to, t there's a little twist. So first, the underlying idea is similar. Just use superpositions of coherent states to encode information, which you can store quantum information. But the twist is that if there's a photon being lost, if you just use a superposition of all these possible states, you actually, the photon loss introduce a logical error, which, you, which is very hard to correct. So instead, you, the trick is that you need to use a fixed parity logical subspace to encode the information. So let me show you how this works. So for example, you can consider the symmetric combination of alpha and negative alpha as a logical state zero, and the symmetric combination of I alpha and the negative I alpha as a logical state one. And with this type of encoding, you can store initial photon states, which is even photon number, and in the presence of photon loss, one photon loss, it goes to odd, goes to even, goes to odd, goes to even, and then go back to the original state. So essentially there's a cycle of life of these states in the presence of photon loss. So basically if you can keep track of this parity of the states, you can identify individual photon loss without disclosing what's the information being stored in the system. So the key is you need to have a quantum non-demolition measurement of the photon number parity. And this is actually has been demonstrated using superconducting circuit systems with the photons and with microwave photons inside the cavity. So potentially one could consider do frequency conversion from optical to microwave to use superconducting circuit to detect the parity and then undo the conversion. But uh, 
But overall, this is a potential scheme which allows you to correct single photon loss errors using just one optical mode and can detect a single photon parity. And uh, furthermore, you do not need to correct the error. You basically just need to keep track of the error. It also works. So I think that I'm probably a little running a little bit out of time. So I just uh, briefly went through that there's a quantum network of clocks, which can potentially be an application of a global scale quantum network that can give you a boost performance of the clock precision. Basically, you can achieve a Heisenberg limited precision with a number of clocks instead of one over square root of n, which is currently nowadays what people do with a clock. And furthermore, using quantum cryptography techniques, we can optimize use of the resources and we can introduce security against the sabotage and eavesdropping so that we'll have a really a secure quantum network of clocks. So just as a summary, here are the things that I talked about. Generation of repeater schemes, comparison, codes for quantum repeaters, and the quantum network of clocks. And thank you for your attention. We have time for questions. Yes? Thank you, nice talk. Uh, one is comment. Actually, the all photonic quantum repeater is just a time reversed of the second generation quantum repeater. Therefore, I cannot uh, uh, agree with that uh, our all photonic quantum repeater is categorized to the, into the third generation according to your rule for the such a classification. This is mm -hmm. just comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, actually, Actually, uh, okay, in order to perform the second and third generation by using matter quantum memory, in such a case, we need to perform the entangling gate for the matter quantum memory, right? Uh, we uh, need to perform deta what deta gate? Deterministic CZ gate. Deterministic gates, gates. Yeah, yeah. yes. In such a case, but uh, in order to perform the second and third generation by using matter quantum memory, in such a case, we need to have a good efficient coupling with photons as well. And so, in such a case, we need cavity as well. And so, how to realize such a... <laughs> Namely, we at, at some point we need to deterministic entangling gate for matter quantum memory. Yeah. At the same time, we need a good coupling with photon. In such a case, we need a good cavity, right? How to how to compensate such a some contradicting? <laughs> state? Yeah. So, so I guess the question is about uh, second and third generation quantum repeaters. How to uh, do both? One is the efficient coupling with optical mode, and uh, the other is reliable local gates, right? And uh, so I think there are several physical platforms which seems to be very promising. One is actually related to the one that I mentioned that one can do the uh, nanophotonics, integrated nanophotonics, which you can have like arrays of atoms aligned in the couple to the waveguide, and the waveguide can efficiently couple to the outside world. And uh, locally, you can swap these, at you can do gates on these atoms and via the waveguide so that uh, you can have a high coupling efficiency. Oh, sorry, uh, reliable local gates combined with high coupling efficiency. Another system could be superconducting circuits. You can locally have a reliable few qubit system, and combined with the frequency conversion, you can have optical access. Yeah. Another question? And also not to say the trapped ion system, which is also compatible. Yeah. Last call for another question. If not, why don't we uh, thank our speaker again?